Uh, if you'd open your Bibles with me this morning to Matthew 22, we'll get there in just a moment. But we're going to be on uh, you know, installment six of The Greatest Show on Earth. And as I said a long time ago, most of us know that because we're all old enough to know that, that I stole this title from Cecil B. DeMille and his movie of the 50s, but um, it's because I believe it's really appropriate for where we are going forward. And um, so there are some implications that were on my heart with this terminology, the greatest show on earth. And so I want to speak to you about, you know, initially today about some of the things that the greatest show on earth implies. First of all, show. Let's just take that word show. You know, show tells us it's a doing thing. Isn't that right? Show tells us it's a doing thing, that there is visible, that there is discernible, that there is measurable, you know, effectual doing taking place. In other words, you know, we're not promoting the greatest speech on earth, the greatest idea on earth, the greatest doctrine of the church. We're not promoting something of that nature what we're actually promoting right now is something that is visible, discernible, measurable, and effectual. It's the greatest show on earth. What else does that tell us? It tells us that if there's a show, there's an audience of some sort, right? There's an audience. And so we are performing not for, but to. I'm going to say to. We're standing before an audience, but we are performing towards the audience, right? They are experiencing the benefit of the show. They are the beneficiaries of the show, of the greatest show on earth. <clears throat> I want you to tr look at Matthew 22, and this will all be familiar with you. Verse 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment, the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Which is the great commandment? Which is the great commandment? Now the word great here, this particular word that's translated great here, is a, is a word that refers to the external form, to the sensible appearance of a thing. Okay? In other words, a great mountain or whatever. So it, it, it's a word that implies, but in its, in its usage, they're visible, discernible, measurable, once again. So in other words, this man isn't asking, you know, <clears throat> which is the greatest doctrine in the law? Which is, you know, see, what have we learned about commandment? I know that a lot of you can remember that I talked about commandment before. I, I said the difference in a demand and a command is that a demand is just something that is laid before you, and it's a do it or else type of thing. But a command, if we understand, always has kind of a military connotation to it. And a command is a strategy for victory, success, and accomplishment. So this man is not asking what is the greatest doctrine, where we might think that because he asked about which is the greatest commandment. He wasn't saying what is the greatest teaching or what is the greatest idea from the law, even though that certainly was also there too. But what he was really doing more accurately was he's saying which directive or which strategy you know, from the law will produce the most discernible, visible, measurable impact upon humanity. That's what he was asking. And to that question, Jesus deferred immediately to the law of Deuteronomy 6.5, Deuteronomy 10.12, and Leviticus 19.18, where we get the combination of these two statements here that he's quoting, right? <clears throat> In verse 38, Jesus starts off here this, and he's referring back to verse 37. What is verse 37? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And so in verse 37, then he's, or verse 38, he says this is the first and the great, right? This is the first and the great. And then in verse 39, again, I know you're all familiar with this, but in verse 39 then he says, and the second is like it. And a few versions actually have gone to the trouble to recognize that when he says 
The second is like it, that really what he's saying with the, by the use of the word he's using here is that the second is the same. It's the, it's the image of, the reflection of. What he's done here, what Jesus has done here for us is he's made the two into one. And John got this. John got this. John said this over in 1 John 4.20. John said, <clears throat> he, who does not, he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? You hear the implication there? John understood the two are one. When Jesus said the second's like it, he said the second is the same. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You shall love the Lord your God. He said you're not loving the Lord your God unless you're loving humanity, unless you're loving mankind around you, right? So the second is the same. It's the image or the reflection of. John says, you know, how can you love God whom you have not seen if you cannot love your brother whom you have seen? So there's, a, there's, a, there's an understanding we need to begin to get right now on that. And what we're doing, and what I said on Facebook this morning, is that we are in our final preparations for taking to the stage, taking to the world stage with the greatest show on earth. We're still here preparing. We're, we're, we're coming to an understanding of what it means to be participators, actors. Cecil B. DeMille's cast of thousands, Jesus Christ's cast of millions. We're coming to the understanding. We're putting the final touches on our rehearsal so to speak, okay? Not that I don't believe that many of us have been already practicing these things out there, you know, putting on little mini shows, right? Okay. But anyway, go with me over to Mark's uh, statement of this in Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard him reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it. It is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Right? I think it's interesting he begins this, that the Lord your God is one. And then he goes on and he makes again this, this, this combining of you shall love the Lord your God and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he brings them together. Once again, he says the second again is the same. It's the image of the reflection so I think we need to go back, and we need to back up that one verse, and we need to understand when he said the Lord our God is one, he's including that, including us in that. He's not just saying there's a single God out there. There's one God out there, and there's no other gods out there. But what he is saying, I believe in this, is, is that we need to all understand that he has made us all one in him. Right? Okay. But notice he says then, the second is the same. And then when he says here, there is no other commandment greater, let's read what we understand now, there is no strategy greater, there is no prescription greater, there is no strategy that promises visible, discernible, measurable, effectual impact upon humanity other than this. I'll make sure we get this right. All right, the second implication to me of the greatest show on earth, think about this, the second implication of it is that there are other shows on earth. This is the greatest show on earth. Now, when I say there are other shows on earth, I'm not referring to what the, uh, uh, you know, to, to, the, to the evil shows or the bad shows. I want you to understand that when he says the greatest show on earth, I believe that the implication is there are some other shows on earth that are lookalikes. They're very close, but they're not quite what Jesus is prescribing, right? They're not exactly what Jesus has in mind as the strategy of change, as the strategy for restoring creation, one creature at a time, if necessary. But anyway, similar shows are there. What is his prescription? The great, the greater, the greatest. 
So what is, what is the strategy that's producing the maximum discernible, effectual change for humanity? What is the prescription that Jesus offers us, you know, to begin to restore or begin to deliver the creation from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God, as Paul tells us in Romans 8? What is that? Well, let's use Paul's language when he Paul's language once again in 1 Corinthians 13. The greatest of these is love, right? So again, obviously all I'm trying to do is, is nail down <laughs> that love is the greatest show on earth. That love, love, love is the greatest show on earth, right? Okay. Now, this unique prescription from Jesus, this unique strategy that's given us by Jesus, which, by the way, we, remember, we've already learned this, is in total contradiction to the wisdom of the world, in total contrast to the usual understanding of, of power and how power is to be employed in the world, right? There's a dunamis of God, there's a dunamis of man. The dunamis of God is in total contrast to the dunamis. The dunamis of God is considered weakness by men. Right, the wisdom of God is considered foolishness by men. So when we when we hear this, and and I can't even tell you, and I, and I know we've we've over the years had had so much interaction with people who would just really struggle with this concept, and and you know one of the reasons for the, I mean I know this to be true. One of the reasons for the shrinking of our own congregation here is that, and I realize there are some people that are just out of town and stuff, but I mean, of the shrinking of this congregation has to do with the fact that as, as we continue to extend the limits, not the limits, the limitless love of God, and we continue to make that known, people can't go any further. They reach a place where that's as far as they can go, and they can't go any further. You know, it's, it's one thing to have to say, okay, I can love the Baptists. But then it becomes another thing to say, I can love the Muslims. And then another thing to say, we should, we, we, we should have love for, for, the, for, for ISIS among the, I mean, whatever it is, you know what I'm saying? And so people finally have that limit where they hit the wall. And I understand that. I realize that. There was a time when my wall was so far <laughs> back from where it is now I, I'm not aware of a wall right now. You know what I'm saying? Not that I won't become aware of a wall. There was a time when I thought I was really embracing the love of God for the world. There was a time when I heard preachers preach about hell, and I thought, yeah, that is a message of love, because what they're trying to do is make people realize how they cannot be burned in the end, you know, whatever, you know? Most of us have been there. Yeah. Isn't that right? Well, anyway... But this unique prescription of Jesus, we need to understand, is, is regardless of how it stacks up with the world's wisdom and, and the world's idea of a power of the power to change, we need to realize that it is nevertheless the tide turner. It's nevertheless the regimen of restoration. Because Jesus has declared this to be that which restores humanity, restores creation restores humanity to the revelation and the understanding of the Father's love for all mankind. So anyway, apparently we need to take another look, or a better look, at what Jesus had in mind when he said these things about love, because so much of what we've done, we've said we've done, the church, under the umbrella of love, but we've left so much to be desired, right? And we've really contributed more to chaos and to the continuing of corruption and domination than we've done to repair anything or restore anything. We've created doctrines that have driven them in a way. We've created doctrines and teachings, and, and, and uh, we've become comfortable in those things that have separated, that have created walls, that have, that have built walls, that have built dis discrimination, that have, that have done these things, right? We've had, we have... I mean, starting in the home, we have, we have domination in the home, we have domination in the church, we have domination, uh, the, the, these are the principalities and powers, we have domination in the society, domination in nations, domination around the world, we have domi domination, right? 
And, and so we, we've, and we've done more in most cases. I mean, just read what most Christians write today about world conditions, what many churches write about household conditions, home conditions, how it ought to be in the home. Think about that. See? And so we really, I don't believe, have, have understood what Jesus had in mind because Jesus said there's no greater strategy for salvation, for the salvation of human life, for the salvation of the home, of the nation, whatever it is, than this strategy of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, because the two are one and the same. You can't do one without the other, right? Okay. <clears throat> so let's go back for a minute to 1 John chapter 3, and let's... let's see what John, and of course John, whether it be John in actuality or disciples of John between the Gospels and the Epistles and so on and so forth in the book of Revelation, I don't have enough scholastic or whatever understanding to know who, if, if it's all in fact the same John, but, but that's not important because the message is the same. In the Gospel of John and the Epistles of John, the message is always about love. And so, let's see what it was that John learned from Jesus. In John, 1 John 3, 16. By this we know love. Because he laid down for his, his life for us, we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, we're going to talk more about that particular aspect of this little short passage in the next time. But anyway. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. This is something that John had learned, obviously, from Jesus. This is what John perceived in, in, in the time that he spent with Jesus and in, the, and the, in the obser his observations of Jesus, his revelation and understanding of the mission of the incarnation. Let us not love in word or in tongue. It sounds like he's saying the same thing, but the word word there is logos, the word tongue is glossa. And really what he's talking about here with the word logos is, is let, us not, let, let us not love in the concept and idea of another but or or in tongue. Let us not. Let, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. It's like I've said before. My revelation is not good for you. You have to have your own revelation. Let us not say we love based on the concept or the idea of another, right? But actually, let us love in deed and in truth. All right. So he's making a distinction here between. Well, I'll get there in just a moment, so let me go there now. So he said, let us not love in the concepts and ideas of another, meaning Jesus, or with only our speech, but in deed and in truth. So simply put, he's saying, <clears throat> it's not about saying love, it's about doing love. Did you get that? It's not about saying we love, it's about doing love. See, love is not a saying thing. We need to get that. Now, it's not wrong to reinforce the actions of love by saying you love, obviously, but love is not a saying thing. It's not a Valentine's card. It's not, you know, that's not what love is. It's, it's not saying to my wife that I love her and then verbally abusing her, as I did so often for so many years. See, all the years that I was verbally abusive to my wife, I was forever saying, I love you so much. And, you know, she got to the point where she was actually expecting some kind of demonstration of that. How ridiculous, you know. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Love is not a saying thing. Love's a doing thing. And that's what Jesus is telling us. There is no greater strategy than this. Love. No greater prescription for bringing health back into humanity than love. We ought to know this. This ought not to be something that catches us the slightest off guard. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, so, so here's the thing. So doing, doing, doing <laughs> that, that concept and word that is, you know, strikes fear in the hearts of word of faith people, 
grace people, charismatic people, Western evangelical deconstruction. It's doing. That's a word they don't like. And yet doing, if we understand it here, is the beginning, and I want to emphasize that word beginning for a moment, is the beginning of what Jesus had in mind when he said, love one another. Love your brother. Love your neighbor. Love your adversary. Love your enemy. Love your Samaritan other. Love your lifestyle opposite. Love your religious different, etc., etc. Jesus, when he said love, he said do. He was saying at the beginning, the beginning of what he said was doing. Let us not love in word or in tongue, but in doing and in truth. He has that end in truth. We're going to get to that, right? Okay. So doing unto the effect that Jesus desires, okay, which, by the way, is not the reconciliation of the aforementioned lives to your satisfaction, So when he tells me to love my Samaritan other, that doesn't mean that I am to expect that their lives will become, or that their behaviors, or that things about them will become reconciled to my way of thinking. Right? That's what I'm saying. I just want to put that in there. So doing unto the unto the you know the, the, the effect that Jesus promises is doing, now listen to me carefully, doing from the predisposition that John calls truth. So in other words, <laughs> it's not indeed alone right now. It's indeed in truth. John says there is a predisposition that goes along with this. John did not say, let us not love in word or in tongue, but let us love in deed. He said deed and in truth. Let me give you an example. See, there's a a doing that meets momentary need. There is a doing that meets momentary needs, right? But is not from the predisposition necessarily of truth. Now, let me give you an example to help this become clearer to you. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, or 13, 3. I'll just read this to you. Though I bestow, y'all know this, though I bestow all my goods. So we're talking about visible discernible, measurable something, aren't we? He said, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and then he goes on saying, offer my body to be burned. But I just want to focus on this one part. But have not love, it profits me nothing. Now, part of the problem we have with that is because that's a horrible way to render that. Charismatics love that. Word of faith people love that. But profits me nothing. It was not about his profit. It was not about Paul being benefited by it. It might have better been understood, <clears throat> if I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, but I have not love, I have not used my giving to the greatest advantage of the others. You hear the difference in that? It's not about me profiting, it's about them profiting. Some versions say it this way, if I bestow all my goods to, to, to meet the needs of the poor, but I have not love, I profit, but oftentimes that word means contribute, nothing. See, like when we, we over in John 6, 63, where it says the spirit, it's the spirit that gives life, the flesh profits nothing. Well, we know that our flesh has benefited and profited by the spirit of God, the life of the spirit of God. But he's talking about contributes. The flesh isn't making a contribution to that. It's the recipient of it. And it's the same thing here. Paul's saying, though I bestow all my goods. So see, here is a giving, here is a doing that lacks something. He said, but I have not love. I have not used my giving to the greatest advantage of those others to whom I have bestowed all my gifts. I've met a momentary need, right? Now, there's no question that bestowing all your goods to feed the poor is certainly credible giving. Right? So I said, remember I said, the greatest show on earth says to me that there are other shows on earth. And not necessarily bad shows. Beneficial shows to some degree, but not to the degree that Jesus desires this thing to be understood. Now, is Jesus saying we should withhold if we can't know? No, we're not talking like that. We're not saying, well, if I can't, if, if, going forward here, if I, if I don't, can't even understand truth, then I shouldn't give it all. That's ridiculous. Right? 
But it's the stuff, when you think about it, it's the stuff that this, this credible giving, this credible, these deeds, this is the stuff that John was talking about when he just said, let us not love in word or in tongue, but let us love in deed. It's the stuff of the deeds. It's what the deeds are made out of. Things like bestowing all our get, goods. And, and we're going to get into all of this. We're gonna, next time, we're going to talk about what love really looks like. And uh, we're going to talk so, so that we have an understanding. But first of all, we have to establish this concept of truth. Because there is a, there is a means of imparting, doing, deeds, giving, so on and so forth, that is not what Jesus has prescribed. It is not what the strategy of Jesus are we to withhold it? No, we're not to withhold it, but we're to take it to its ultimate. We're to get all the mileage we can out of it, in other words, right? Okay? Okay. <clears throat> so that's all doing while I have not love, what Paul's talking about, right? Now listen to what this is. This is going to be good for us. I'm taking it slow here because I want us to get this. Doing while I have not love is more like tolerance. I'm going to say some things that it's more like. I want you to get them. It's more like tolerance. It's arm's length acceptance. It's as if Jesus said, be good to them in spite of them and let me sort them out. You know, that's a few words I put together that say what the church has said. Love the sinner but hate the sin. Listen, you're making a connection right there in that statement that is contrary to what Jesus said, right? But so, as I said, it's, it's more like tolerance. It's more like arm's length acceptance. Here's another thing that it is. It's sacrificial allowance of perceived ungodliness. I'm going to sacrifice what I perceive to be godly <laughs> for their perceived ungodliness. I'm going to sacrificially allow them to exist in my sphere of influence, in my sphere of relationship. You know, I'm not going to stay away and avoid the homosexual at work anymore. I'm not going to turn my back on the Muslim who doesn't agree with any of my Christian principle. I'm not going to, you know what, I could go on all day with that. You know I could too. I can go on all day about anything, but I mean that in particular right now, right? Okay. Let me tell you some other things it is. This imparting all my goods, bestowing all my goods, you know, meet the needs of the poor or whatever, all these other giving things that we can do. Another thing it is, is compulsory giving. The very thing that the church has revolted against with regard to writing checks because of the fact that so many years they were under compulsion to tithe if God was going to bless them, Right? But you see, the same thing we're talking about, that's what it is. We do these things, right? It's obedience giving. Whoa, wait a minute. Aren't, I'm going to get there in a minute. Remember, this is, what, <laughs> this is what having not love is like. Okay? Doing without having love. It's compulsory giving. It's obedience giving. It's what most self-identified liberal Christians do in order to feel inclusive, but it's have not love. Really? Listen, the, 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 the so-called liberal Christians that are out there, and among us, and I don't mean necessarily here right now, but you know what I'm saying? When I say out there, I don't, I don't ever want to disconnect, but, but, but what I'm saying is this. They're very liberal in their, I love this, and I love that, and yes, we're to love this, and yes, but... but in most cases, in many cases, it is. It's arm's length acceptance. It's the sacrificial allowance of an ungodly lifestyle or an ungodly belief system or whatever it is, perceived ungodly by them. Okay, But I'm going to be liberal in my declarations of love because this makes me inclusive. No, it doesn't. That doesn't make us inclusive. We are still excluding them. That's what Paul is saying. They haven't benefited the most they could benefit from my giving if I do it without love. See what I'm saying? They really haven't received the benefit that my master wanted me to impart to them as he exposed me to this wonderful strategy for redeeming humanity. But redeeming humanity, doesn't that mean they're going to become like me? 
Hell, I hope not. And I really hope they don't become like you. <laughs> no, you understand what I'm saying, right? But that's, the way, that's what we've had. That's been our idea of redeeming, too. Coming into agreement with me and my lifestyle and my... Isn't that right? Allowing them to be, graciously allowing them to be. Because I love them, because Jesus loves them. I'll just trust Jesus to sort them out and to bring them around. Hmm. Jesus told us to do it. And he didn't tell us to bring them around to our way of thinking. He said, bring them around to the revelation of my love for them. Regardless, all right? Okay. So as I said, it's compulsory giving. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And boy, if you grew up in the Word of Faith Church, you, you already, your Bible probably falls open to this one because every week it was used to get you to give more. But anyway, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I'm just going to use a little bit of it so that we don't bring back too many bad memories of compulsory giving. <laughs> in verse 5, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. So again, Paul's suggesting that giving could have been just a grudging obligation. Go down to verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, or some versions say under compulsion. And we've all had, we've all had that opportunity to give under compulsion, which sometimes leaves us giving grudgingly because, wow, I remember when Marilyn and I first got started, you know, we've always been givers, but I can tell you in the very beginning, for me, not for my wife, she's much more generous than I am, or was back then. I mean, I, th I think I finally have come around a little bit. But, but I'll tell you what, it was hard to write that 10% I was being demanded of. When I had five and six children and not much income, they needed to eat, and we needed to pay the rent, and we needed this, and we needed that. You know what I'm saying? But I gave faithfully all the time. I don't know if it was, could even be called faithfully because I was begrudging that I had to do it. See what I'm saying? Now, again, I don't want to get into the church giving type of thing again, I, but I'm using that because a lot of us are pretty familiar with that. So when, when Paul talks about grudging obligation or grudgingly or of necessity or compulsion, what he's really doing here is he's showing us the backside of in deed and in truth. John's telling us how it ought to be. Paul's telling us how it ought not to be, right? So he's showing us the backside of in deed and in truth, right? So what is truth then? Truth... <clears throat> Truth is a heart that's in agreement with Jesus, first of all. Isn't that right? Truth is a heart that is in agreement with the mission of the incarnation. That's why I spent so many weeks talking about the mission of the incarnation, helping us understand what his, what his understood mission was, the restoration of mankind to the revelation and the understanding that they were and always had been the image and the likeness of God, that they were and always had been the sons and daughters of God, the children of God, in other words, that they were and always had been holy, sacred in His sight, that they always, always, always had been in relation, that it was only in their mind, only in their heart, that they had become separated, alienated from God. The mission of the Incarnation was to show the, 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 the huge embrace of the Father for all of mankind, all of their brothers and neighbors and adversaries and enemies and Samaritan others and so on and so forth. That was the, that was the mission of the Incarnation. To embrace all of those religions that they were familiar with down there that you know, the uh, Buddhism and, and Hinduism and all those things that predate Christianity by centuries, right? To embrace 
and to understand and realize that the wisdom of God was in many places that they had never allowed themselves to venture. To help them understand that the wisdom of God was not contained just in the Torah or that today it is not contained just in our New Testament or in our, or, or in our assembled Bible. That the wisdom of God is wherever God is, is, is welcomed in whatever way that they have perceived God and asked to give wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, any place in the world at any time, let him ask of God, his God, who gives to all men liberally and without reproach, without looking for any reason to discredit the request. That's what that means, without reproach. See? This is the mission of the incarnation. And so when we talk about truth, what is truth? Truth is a heart that is not in concept only saying, well, Jesus said, or this is what Jesus wants, but it's a heart that has embraced the mission of the incarnation, and it said, I am in agreement with Jesus. I'm in agreement with Jesus about what? About the sanctity, about the, about the value of, of, of my Guatemalan neighbors, of my, of my Syrian refugees, of my, of my next-door neighbor who's a real ass. Right? I'm in agreement with Jesus. I don't have any next-door neighbors like that, by the way. So if this gets out. <laughs> I, would, I would say there are probably some of my next-door neighbors that couldn't say that about their next-door neighbor, though. <laughs> but anyway. So as I said, <clears throat> so, so truth is a heart of agreement with Jesus. Now listen to me carefully. Truth is not obedience to Jesus. I want you to get that. Truth is not obedience to Jesus. Truth is a heart that is in agreement with the mission of the incarnation. See, obedience to Jesus was what John was talking about when he said, not us, let us not live in logos, I mean love in logos, in concept and idea, right? Let not our structure of reality just simply be based on someone else's idea. And see... That's what, he, that, that's what so many of us have. We have a construct that's based on the fact that Jesus said, love your neighbor. But until it becomes our own revelation, until it becomes our own embraced truth, until it becomes our truth, it's have not love. Yes, I must obey. No, you must not obey. Yes, you'll get the opportunity to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. So truth is this. Truth is, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's truth. Let this mind. Think the way Jesus thinks about things, about people, about these things, right? That's truth. So now, what's John saying? He's saying, now let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed... That is, predis, predis, with the predisposition, predispos, you know what I mean, predisposition of love in our hearts, right? Not just in deeds only either. But don't withhold the deeds. That's not what it's about either. <clears throat> so in other words, truth is the revelation in you of the reality of the mission of the incarnation. Now, down here in verse 7, I'll have to bring this out because we've all had this one thrust to us before. <clears throat> Charismatic people have, word of faith people. For God loves a cheerful giver. Everybody on your feet with your check in your hand. And we've been told that that word is hilaros, which it is in the Greek. And so we ought to be hilarious givers. So let us hilariously, cheerfully run around the sanctuary, waving our check, and then take it up and give it to the guy who needs it for his Mercedes payment on this month. Well, come on. I went to a lot of Word of Faith churches. <laughs> honestly, I can honestly say I never pastored one. But only because, you know, there was just so far I could go. But, there, but some of this stuff I did believe. But I didn't believe it to that extent. <laughs> never have. But so we have God loves a cheerful giver. Wow. Now, I'm going to share this with you. The word haleros there is a word that means propitious. 
Now, we know that's the word pro- pro- propitiation, but let me think about this. When you think about propitiation, when you think about propitious, what do you think about? What should you think about? Others. What is propitiation about? The redemption of others. The reclaiming of others is what propitious means, right? Now, in this case, Paul was talking about them sending this offering back to the poor saints in uh, Rome. Okay, that's what this was about. And so it was talking about redeeming their circumstances. It was talking about providing a propitious offering for these people to get them back on their feet, to feed them, right? And the word that's translated here, it means propitious, it, it means redemptive or graciously favoring others, see? God loves a cheerful giver. Let's run around with our check, and as you give, God's going to bless you because you gave with love, and it's going to profit you something. That's not what Paul was saying. That's not what he's saying here. Propitious means to be redemptive in your intent. The heart, let this mind be in you, which was also... Can you imagine Jesus thinking about his provision and his, well, you know, his material provi- things. You know, oh, Jesus didn't do things in order to get from folks, did he? Okay. So these are the these are the have love folks. You know, they're they're rooted in the truth of of Second Corinthians five. Let's go over there. You know this too. Second Corinthians five fourteen. These folks. That the have love folks are rooted in this truth that we're so familiar with. For the love of Christ compels us, verse 14, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one anywhere, at any time, in any circumstance, according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, throw that word if out of there, it doesn't belong. Anyone in Christ is a new creation. Well, who's in Christ? He just told us up above. One died for all, therefore all died. Where was humanity when Jesus was hanging on the cross? In Christ. Anyone in Christ is a new creation, right? Old things, things is a bad word. It's talking about humanity right now. The old has passed away. Behold, all has become new. Right? These people that have love, I'm not saying that's not you. I'm just saying in in the have not love and the have, the haves and the have nots, the haves are rooted in this truth, in this revelation, right? Now, this version said the love of Christ compels us. And that's indirectly a good good rendering, but... The word more, con- more correctly or more directly means to constrain or to compress together. So let's think about this. It means to hold together. This is what the, the word that's translated constrains means. To hold together any whole, lest something or anything fall away from it. It means to compress together, lest anything fall away from it. Lest anything be taken away from it. To compress together, right? So here's what he says. He says, the love of Christ holds us together as a whole, lest something fall away from us. Well, who is the us? The us he just said. One died for all, then all died. The love of Christ compresses all that together as one. Right? He holds all that together, lest any part of that should fall away or be taken away or stripped away by man. The love of Christ does that. Right? One died for all, and all died. So, the love of Christ holds all for whom he died, compressed together, lest any any fall away from him. And that revelation is the compelling truth. Now we can get back to the love of Christ compels us. That revelation is the compelling truth that motivates and empowers our deeds. So now we've come the full circle here. Now it's let us not love in word. And in tongue, because love ain't a saying thing, love's a doing thing. Let us love in deed and in truth. But deed alone is insufficient, not because supplying people's needs and, and all of the things that we're going to look at in the future uh, aren't, aren't beneficial to them momentarily or even for, for maybe a longer period of time, but because it's not complete. I haven't used my giving 
to the best possible advantage for them. If I have not love, if I do not have the revelation of Father's love, of the, of, the, of the love of Christ for them, and if I have not entered into agreement with that, if I have not become one with that, and this is where people are fighting and turning their backs on, 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 a, lot of the, on a lot of the understanding that's coming forward in the church of where we have fallen short as a church. And many folks are jumping out there, and, and, and you know what? They're to be commended for it. Many folks are jumping out there. And, and uh, my, my wife's aunt was a, a woman who was a part of a social gospel. That was the, that was the uh, uh, title that was put on them by others. A social gospel Methodist church that was different than the evangelical Methodist church. But Mary was a person who was doing for people, doing, 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 you know. Didn't talk an awful lot about Jesus, but she was a doer, right? But I know she didn't have a revelation of this truth. She's with Jesus. I'm not concerned about that. She's passed away and gone, but she's with Jesus. But they didn't preach that gospel that, that we grew up with all the time. They preached this other gospel, this gospel that said, loving your neighbor is doing, 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 doing. And so they got, people got some benefit from that. And, and it was, you know what, when you don't have any food and groceries show up at your house, that's a huge benefit. Can you imagine a huge benefit like that, though, being understood as not the full benefit that Jesus wants? Jesus wants full bellies. He wants warm, clothed children. He wants all of these things. But he wants even more. He wants them to have the revelation of the mission of the incarnation. And so if I give and have not love, I haven't really gotten the most out of my giving. And so, so John says, do the deeds, but don't stop with the deeds. Embrace the truth. Have a revelation of the truth, right? So love us, let us love in deed and in truth, right? All right. Now, Jesus offers us you know, another take on, John 3, 18, on 1 John 3.18. Go with me over to Matthew 23. Now, I'm just about through. Yeah, we're going to make it in time. I'm listening to your thoughts. I hear some of you. Oh, here he goes again. No. Now, this whole chapter, you know, we all know it as the woe chapter. Woe to the Pharisees. Woe to the scribes. Woe to this. Woe to that. I'm just going to go down, and there's a whole lot, really a whole lot we could benefit from this thing as in our understanding. But just going down to verse 18. For whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Think about this. Which is greater? I'm going to read, when I read, excuse me, when I read deed, you read gift. I mean, when I read gift, you read deed. Okay, where we have said. So Jesus is saying, which is greater, the deed or the altar that sanctifies the deed? Right, So Jesus didn't say that the deed was insignificant. He didn't say that the gift was you know, to be despised or was insignificant. What he said was that the altar, what is the altar? The cross, or let's make it as it is, the love of Christ. The love of Christ, that's the altar. It's the love of Christ that was displayed on the cross, right? That's the altar that sanctifies the deed. This is what John is talking about. Let us not love in deed alone, you know, but in truth. Obviously, he said, let us not love in word and tongue, but he said, in deed and in truth. The deed is of value to people. There's no question about it. But there's a greater value. It's the altar. It's the cross. It's what that means to all of mankind, that one died for all, therefore all died. And so consequently... That's the sanctification of the deed right there, right? That's what sanctifies it. And that's what empowers the gift to do its fullest. That's what empowers the gift to perform its fullest. That's where we've come up short. That's why we look at these things and we, we say that doesn't work, that can't work. See, that's why we have become unbelievers in believing skin. Because we say that can't work. We cannot allow people to live that kind of a lifestyle. We can't condone it. We can't support it. 
We can't contribute to it in any way. I can't bake a cake for that couple. Right? That's what we say. But I am a Christian. I am a believer. No, I'm an unbeliever in believer's skin. That's what I am. I can't, I can't, I can't. Because I have not love. Oh, well, I love him, but he needs... No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, don't leave it to me to straighten them out. You give them love and let love have its effect in people's lives. And don't necessarily expect that love that you give to them to have them come out looking like you all of a sudden. Because Jesus said, that's why I'm giving you love, because I want love to change you too. No, not really. But, you know, yeah, yeah, really. I mean, because love changes us. And I don't mean the way we think of change. Okay. <clears throat> look over in the last scriptures. Look over at Matthew 5 also. As I said, Jesus gives us a little bit different look at some of these things. Not, these, are, these are, I think, well, they're, they're not another take on John. John's was a take on what Jesus had to say, obviously. John 5, 23 and 24. Therefore, if you bring your deed or your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother, and we have been over this a million times, your brother is your neighbor, is your adversary, is your enemy. Jesus makes that clear throughout these first chapters of Matthew. Okay, Your brother is every man, woman, and child that ever lives on the face of this earth. Okay, That's your brother because Jesus has embraced them, brought them into the family or reminded them that they were always in the family and said, you may not discount them as family members. You must understand they are mine, as you are mine. They are as much mine as you are mine. I don't care that they don't act like you. They are as much mine as you are mine. And I don't care that you act so much better than them. You're, you're not more mine than they are. See? All right, so Jesus said, if you bring your deed to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there. Leave your deed there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. All right. So again, the greatest or the, or the fullest value in the gift or the deed is the truth of the reconciliation of all mankind. That's why he's saying, go be reconciled to your brother. And this is what Paul understood in 1 Corinthians 13 when he said, If I do, but have not the heart of, of reconciliation, I haven't gotten the maximum mileage out of my gift or my deed. That's my paraphrase. You recognize that, right? So Paul's talking about having a heart of reconciliation, having a revelation of the reconciliation of all mankind by this Jesus, by this incarnate God, right? And so another way I want you to understand this in, verse, in chapter 5 of Matthew is this. When your giving or your deed is altar-focused, he said, when you bring your gift to the altar. In other words, when it is altar-focused. It doesn't have to go to a physical place. What is the altar? The cross. What is the cross? The revelation of the reconciliation of all mankind. The love of Christ that constrains or compresses all together as one. That's so hard to get a hold of for Christians. That the love of Christ has compressed all of this massive, disobedient, hateful, murderous, terroristic, you know, religiously, whatever, it as one. It just can't be that way. It just can't be that way. See, that's the way we have been. Okay. He says, but when your giving or your deed is altar focused, or in other words, truth aligned, then the remembrance, he says, you go to the altar and you have your gift there, and then you remember that your brother has something against you. What's Jesus really saying? He's saying, listen, when, you're, when your deed is altar focused or truth aligned, the remembrance will always be the reconciliation of all whom he calls brothers. Try to read that into that now. Read that back into what we just read. Understand that that's where Jesus was going with this. Jesus is making this a one-on-one -on -one thing when you bring your gift and you remember your brother has something against you. But what is Jesus pointing towards? What he's about to do. What he's going to do. He's going to take his gift 
to the altar, remembering that all of humanity had something against him. Remembering that all humanity had this separation. That's what's against him, I mean. Had this separation mentality from him. He said, go be reconciled to them. And then. So that's what Jesus is doing. He's looking forward to his own gift, to his own deed, but embracing all of mankind, not just one. So, all right, you get anything out of that? I hope so. Next time, we're going to talk about what does love look like in everyday expression. Uh, next Sunday, Caleb's going to be ministering again and going to continue on in Genesis. I'm excited about that. I haven't been able to hear as many of them in the past. But, so he's going to uh, actually read, he said, the Abrahamic story next week you know, and uh, start getting on with that. But I'm, I'm looking forward to that. We're going to alternate a little bit more, especially during this high school baseball season because I'm going to be busy a lot during the week. And, uh, but I want to hear him teach more anyway, and I want to get Nate up here more. And Anyway, you probably all like me to sit down and shut up, so I will. <laughs> Lord, we love you, and once again, we just offer our, 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 our sorrow for, 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 what it's, for what it can accomplish from this place on the globe. We just offer our sorrow, and, our, and, and we mourn with those who mourn in, in New Zealand and, and, and around the world, Father, wherever we're made aware of of these tragedies and these horrible things, that, these atrocities that are committed man against man. Father, we just, uh, we, we just want to be involved in, in, in a sorrow that produces comfort and peace in life. Thank you, Lord, that your revelation continues to expand in our lives, Father, and that which we think we have now, we will find out later. Uh, we had not yet, and that we are still growing. So thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your grace, your mercy towards us in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Have an awesome, awesome week.